Okay, so what you want to do is you will want to click on the link that I have provided there. And then um, if it takes you to this, you could go to, to go to all issues. Make sure that you uh, click in that you are a student and then you type in sixth grade NMS. The number six with a TH grade NMS, no spaces in there. You should be able to get on this. All right, so I'm going to go into Learning to Skate in a War Zone, this magazine, the January 18th edition. And then what you can do is you can, you know, I, I don't exactly know what it looks like with students, but what um, you can do is you can... You can click on the open presentation view, but I think that it takes you right to the article. So um, should be able to take you right to the article. Let me go ahead and, and look at this. So we're looking at this uh, particular article and I am going to read this to you. Okay, World War II, the children who escaped the Nazis. A heroic effort saved thousands of Jewish children from hate, from hate-fueled violence in the years before the Holocaust. Read one young survivor's story in this runner-up entry to the 2020 Eyewitness to History contest. This is January 18th, 2021 is when this was published. As you read, think about what we, what can we learn from talking with people who have experienced historical events. And you should have watched this video already and answered your two questions. It says, on December 2nd, 1938, a ship docked at Harwich, England. Among its passengers were the 196 children, all traveling without their parents. Clutching the few things they had with them, they stepped down the gangplank into a strange new country and a new chance at life. Less than a month before, the orphanage where they had lived in Berlin, Germany, had been burned down by Nazis. The horrific act was part of a shocking night of violence and a destruction against Jews, Jewish homes, schools, businesses, and synagogues throughout Germany, as well as in Nazi-controlled Austria and part of Czechoslovakia. The attacks that took place on the night known as Kristallnacht, night of broken glass, set off alarm bells throughout Europe. There was no longer any doubt that Germany's Nazi government was intensifying its hostile actions against Jewish people of the continent. It says flames consume a synagogue after Nazis, Nazi attack in Kristallnacht. In the wake of Kristallnacht, the British government agreed to take in and protect Jewish children from Nazi-controlled areas of Europe. Between December 30, 1938 and May 1940, a series of rescue efforts known as the Kinder Transport saved the lives of some 10,000 children, most of them Jewish, fleeing from Nazi threats. But the parents and other loved ones of those children had no choice but to stay behind. Few of them survived World War II. The rest are among the 6 million Jewish people killed by the Nazis during the Holocaust. What led to the crisis that made kinder transport necessary? In January 1933, Adolf Hitler became Germany's leader. He and his Nazi party had risen in, to power in part by tapping into prejudice against the country's Jewish residents, falsely blaming them for Germany's severe social and economic troubles after the nation's loss in World War I. That type of prejudice known as anti-Semitism, had long existed in Europe. But once in control, Hitler focused the full power of his government on wiping out all Jewish people. What you need to know. This is Nazis marching in 1933 in a rally at Nuremberg, Germany. It says Nazis. Members of a political party led by Adolf Hitler from 1921 through the end of World War II. The Nazis sought to dominate Europe and destroy the Jewish people. The word anti-Semitism, hostility toward and prejudice against Jewish people 
It can range from one person's unfair treatment of another to a large-scale cruelties by a society. The most extreme example of official anti-Semitism was the final solution, the Nazis' plan to systematically murder all of Europe's 9.5 million Jewish people. By the end of World War II, six million had been killed, two-thirds of the continent's Jewish population. It started with a series of new laws that restricted which jobs Jewish residents could hold, where they could live, and what they could study. Soon, Jewish citizens had to carry cards that identified them as being of Jewish heritage. Failing to obey such laws could get a person beaten, arrested, or imprisoned. By 1938, tens of thousands of Jewish people had fled Germany, but were finding fewer and fewer safe places to go. In July of that year, nations such as the United States, Great Britain, and France met to discuss the refugee problem. Swayed by their own anti-Semitic suspicions and fears, officials denied most Jewish refugees permission to cross their borders. But that November, following Kristallnacht, British leaders changed course. A rescue operation was quickly organized, with the first tra kinder transport group leaving Germany on December 1st. Europe in 1942. At the height of, its, of power, Nazi Germany and other Axis nations dominated Europe. Opposing them were allied nations, including the U.S. So if we look at this, we see the Axis countries um, are the red ones, the really dark red. And it says Axis controlled or occupied territories are the lighter red colors. So this is where all of the Nazis controlled these countries. And then the allied countries are the green ones. And then neutral countries are this beige. So you can see that the Nazi, uh, Nazis were in control of a lot of Europe most of Europe. Over the next nine months, thousands of Jewish parents made the heart-wrenching decision to send their children away in order to save them. Hundreds of volunteers took on perilous ta the perilous task of smuggling groups of kids from collection points in the cities of Berlin, Vienna, and Prague to seaports, then by ship or boat across the English Channel to Britain. So across this English Channel um, into, into Britain here. Then on September 1st, 1939, Nazi Germany invaded neighboring Poland. World War II had begun. A few more rescue efforts succeeded after that, but the war effectively ended the kinder transport. With German planes bombing British vessels in the English Channel, it became too dangerous to ferry kids across. Charlotte Ketterling was one of the children who owed her life to a kinder transport rescue. Born Charlotte Berger in Austria in 1931, she shared her story last year in this interview by eighth grader Kyla Page. Kyla Page, how old were you when the war was declared? Do you remember that time? Charlotte Ketterling. The actual war started in September of 1939. I'd turned eight in July, but life definitely changed before that, especially when Hitler invaded Austria in March of 1938. We felt the change because we were Jewish. It was absolutely bizarre how people welcomed Hitler to Vienna. They gathered to yell as a big parade of soldiers, horses, and tanks came along. People thought Hitler would make everything right again after World War I. One evening, there was a knock at our door, and a Nazi asked my father to clean the pub across the street. My father refused. I don't remember much as a little child, but I do remember Kristallnacht, uh, when Nazis and other, others killed dozens of Jews, also running Jewish businesses and synagogues, ruining Jewish businesses and synagogues. So when my parents heard that the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Winston Churchill, had agreed to take 10,000 children up to the age of 17, they decided I should go. It was a hard decision for my parents, sending their only child to an uncertain future, but they did it. They told me that when I got there, got to where I'd be going, I would live on a farm, and as a child, 
I was excited about that. Okay. How were you affected by anti-Semitism? I felt one day when a boy ran, I felt it one day when a boy ran after me shouting, Jew, Jew. Luckily I got home safe. What were your parents, what was your parents' attitude toward the Nazis? Did they teach you to fear the Nazis or forgive them? I never felt hatred for them. It was never part of me. I just felt a great sadness. Did you regularly see soldiers or ever see or hear war going on where near your house? When the soldiers first marched in, I saw them, but otherwise I think my mother protected me from seeing them too much. What was the main reasons for your separation from your parents? The main reason was my parents heard that all Jewish children who stayed in Austria would be killed. Later, when my mother was asked if I could move from England to Paraguay in South America, she replied, take my child as far away from Hitler as possible. At that point, I think my mother knew she would never see me again. Key moments, Germany and the Nazis. What was your impression of kinder transport? Each child was allowed to bring a little suitcase with some clothes, a little food, a blanket, and a toy. After I said goodbye to my father, I got on the train, lay on some cardboard on the floor. It was too loud for me to sleep, so I cried and cried until a volunteer woman found what the, found what the matter was and put me in, on a seat where I finally slept. In the morning, my blanket was gone. When we got off the train in Holland, people were more kind and helpful. Were many children on the train crying? How did you feel? Many were crying. After we reached Holland in the evening, we spent the night on a ferry going across the English Channel. The next morning, we landed at Dover, England, where I met my uncle and aunt. Then five of us kids went off in a horse and buggy to our new home, a Christian community of 300 people. Was it hard to get used to your new home? At first, I cried a lot. I also wrote many letters to my mother and asked over and over if the letters were being sent. Soon I experienced my first Christmas and I came to love my new home. When you left Austria, did you know you might never see your parents again? They said they would follow me soon. And as a child, I hoped they would. After a long while, I got a letter from my father who was in a concentration camp saying that he was well, but he didn't know where my mother was. I found out later that she had been killed, but he hadn't wanted to tell me. My father survived the concentration camp, but we never met again. Editor's note, Charlotte Berger Kettering, Kettering moved to the U.S. with her husband and children in 1971. She spent the last six years of her life in Elka Park, New York, where she worked in the school library. She died this past August at the age of 89. Kyla appreciates knowing uh, Ketterling and having a chance to have interviewed her about her childhood, says Kyla. I learned how important it is to uncover these fascinating stories that people can tell, which are the foundations of history itself. So, all right, so that's a pretty um, awesome story. Pretty sad time in, in the history of the world. But um, anyway, I hope that made it easier for you to understand, to listen to it again might have helped. So um, thank you for listening to this and I hope you learned something from it.